thank you everyone for attending our American Medical Association's Women in Medicine Month webinar, Advancing Gender Equity Through Medical Education, Leadership Development, and Medical Practice. My name is Dr. Anita Ravi. I'm the chair of the AMA Women Physicians Section, known as the WPS, and I'm also the Young Physician Section representative to the AMA WPS and a proud family medicine physician based in New York City. Our AMA WPS seeks to increase the number and influence of women physicians in leadership roles and advocate for and advance the understanding of women's health issues. All AMA women members are members of the section and we invite all allies who share our goals to opt in. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Sarah Sweezy, who's a fourth year medical student in the Rural Medical Education Program at the Indiana University School of Medicine. She'll be applying for an obstetrics and gynecology residency this fall, and she's been involved in the AMA since beginning medical school and currently serves as the medical student representative on the WPS Governing Council. Welcome, Ms. Sweezy. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. I'm Sarah Sweezy, your moderator for today. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to share one quick note about our question and answer session. At the end of Dr. Savoy's presentation, we will have time for questions. Please be sure to use the Q&A feature to post your questions as we will not be using the raise hands feature for this session. Now, it is an honor to introduce today's esteemed presenter, Dr. Margot Savoy. Dr. Savoy is the Senior Vice President of Education at the American Academy of Family Physicians and Organizational Champion for Physicians Health First, which is an initiative to help family physicians address burnout and improve well-being. At Temple University, she serves as the Associate Professor of Family and Community Medicine, as well as the Associate Professor of Urban Bioethics and Population Health at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine. Also, Dr. Savoy is an Adjunct Associate Professor at the Maurice H. Comberg School of Dentistry. Dr. Savoy re received her Bachelor of Science in Neurobiology and Physiology and Medical Degree from the University of Maryland. In addition, she received her Master of Public Health from the University of North Carolina Gilling School of Public Health. Dr. Savoy has also completed postdoctoral fellowships in vaccine science, geriatric, interdisciplinary care, and health information technology. It is with, with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Savoy to share insights on ways that medical education, leadership development, and medical practice can help promote gender equity in medicine. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you all for inviting me to be here today. I'm actually really, really, really excited and very honored. Um, I, I don't know that um, this is exactly what I thought I was gonna be doing on this day, getting to hang out with Anita and Joanna and Sarah, but it's a blessing and I'm very excited to be here. So thank you. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about how to approach this, this topic um, without totally boring you at lunchtime on a Friday. Um, and not because necessarily the topic itself is dull or not interesting, but more because I imagine that in many ways, I'm probably pe preaching to the choir if I was trying to give you sort of the, the case for why gender equity is important and why using lenses like medical education or using our leadership development or even our medical practices as ways to drive gender equity are spaces that are important or need to be talked about or thought about. Um, and so I didn't know that that was a good use of our time together. And I was trying to think about what might be a valuable use. So if I was attending this lecture and somebody was gonna come talk about it, what would I kind of hope that I might walk away with? And what I thought about is that I probably would wanna walk away with things that I could do um, that might help me do that work um, in a different way, or at a minimum feel less frustrated as I'm going about my day-to-day -day sort of trying to address those topics, because those are things that are important to me. Now, it's, it's quite possible that, that is not what you came here for today. And actually what you wanted was to get that academic background and have that conversation. And if so, that's okay, because we're saving time for questions at the end. So please, please, please feel free to drop questions in the chat and we'll sort of walk through them um, and see if we can't answer some of the other questions. But what I wanna spend our first part of the time talking about is sort of my, my two cents about thinking about gender equity and where it all fits in. Um, and from my perspective, um, the biggest thing that we can do um, as women to help advance gender equity is to be present in the room so that our literal existence in the space makes a difference. And it makes a difference in ways that people don't even always recognize and that isn't even always tangible, but is truly valuable. Um, and if we're not in the space, people may not notice the difference that we could have made because it's kind of like not getting the vaccine and then not knowing whether or not you prevented the disease or not, but knowing that if you've gotten the vaccine that you had prevented it, same idea. If we're in the room and we know we had an opportunity 
to make sure that issues that were important to us got raised and that they were addressed in a way that really truly got at the basis of what we were concerned about or worried about. But if we're not in the room, we don't even know if it got raised, let alone whether or not it was addressed. Um, and so to me, bringing your own seat, showing up at the table, being at the table and being able to be engaged is the most important thing that we can do um, in order to make sure that our voices are being heard. And I think that happens across the spectrum of what we're talking about here. And so that's what I wanted um, to spend time talking to you about. That and along with some other leadership lessons that helped me feel comfortable having my own seat at the table. Um, and then at the end, like I said, if you've got questions or if I don't cover what you're looking for, um, please absolutely um, um, put questions in the chat so that we can do that. Um, I put in learning objectives because I'm an editor by definition and you can't have a lecture without doing that. And I put this slide in for people who sometimes need to know more about you to understand where you're coming from. And I recognize that I come from a place that stands at the intersection of lots of different things about me um, that make me me. I mean, I'm the oldest child. I think that brings a certain level of bossiness that maybe doesn't show up in other people. Um, I'm a proud big sister. So I, I feel like I've always had to have some version of role modeling as a part of my life because I wanted my sister to always know that she had someone that she could lean on. I went to Maryland, so I'm a terrapin for life. That sort of colors my thoughts. I'm a Virgo. For those of you like Myers-Briggs, I'm an ISTJ. Totally dig dogs more than I did cats. Sorry, cat people, but dogs really rule. I was in the marching band. I like to be drum major. I happen to be a woodwind, so woodwinds will always rule in my life. Um, I do have stuff that I like to do. I'm down for a good mystery story. Really like leadership training. It's one of my favorite things in the world is learning new ways to talk to people, new ways to sort of organize us and ways to get things done. I really just like seeing change happen and whatever it takes for me to learn to get that change to happen to me is exciting. And I, I will solely admit that I have a problem with sugar, that sugar and I are just friends. And so if you've got a cupcake and jelly beans, you're probably my new best friend. I um, mean, like I said earlier about my current day job and, you know, believe it or not, like I actually make time for Twitter still. Um, sometimes people can be a little cranky there, but by and large, it's actually a really neat place to meet people and have conversations and maybe sometimes connect with people you wouldn't otherwise. Um, and so I do hang out there. You're welcome to um, touch base with me there if you've got questions or something comes up that you want to talk about after the talk is over. So that's about me, um, in case you needed to know a little bit more about me before we sort of jump into this. Um, I get bored easily. Um, and so sometimes in talks, I sit the whole time waiting to know what people wanted me to get out of it. Um, and so if you are like me and you need to know where we are going, this is the last slide. So this is where we're going to end up. Um, and the end is that I need you to remember four things. And there's four big key things that I want to talk about with you. One is that you don't wait for invitations. You're going to make your own. Two is that you're going to take your girls with you wherever you go. Three is that you're going to know how to speak to be heard. And then fourth, you're going to protect yourself because without you, there's no you. And if there's no you, then you can't be a voice and you can't have a place because there's not going to be a you. And so protecting you is incredibly important. And so this is where we're going to lay in. But what we're going to do is spend the next few minutes walking through each one a little bit more in detail, just so we could talk about it a little bit more. Shirley Chisholm is like the best. Like, I don't know if you've ever read about her or spent some time thinking about her, but she just said things that were just so profound. Um, even then, that just sort of always ring true to me now. And this quote um, is one that I just really enjoy. It's, it's up in my room and I see it every day. Um, but if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And for me, that is just so par for the course for the way that life feels, particularly being a woman in medicine and particularly a woman in medicine who does leadership education. Um, sometimes you might find that like people didn't invite you to the meeting and they didn't invite you um, into the space. And so you sometimes are gonna have to be the one to sort of break the mold and invite yourself. And if you invite yourself, you don't have to stand in the corner and not be able to engage or have a problem. Just bring your folding chair and pull yourself right up to the table and engage in the conversation with everybody else. And that concept, just that idea, it's so bold and bad that like, I just, it just makes me feel like I could do anything and I could like charge through walls. And so for me, I put this here because A, it gets me all geared up to do the rest of this talk, but B, I hope that it can be something that gets you geared up too. That like, just because people put a barrier in front of you doesn't mean that that's the end of the journey for you. It just gives you yet another way, another space, another time to figure out, well, then how am I gonna get around your barrier? So you didn't give me a chair, brought my own. Didn't give me a space, brought my own, didn't give me a voice, brought my own. So you just figure out a way to be able to make it work, to be able to get done what you need to get done. And so I put that here for that purpose because honestly, she just bakes my day. But um, lesson one was about not waiting for invitations. So, so let, let's start dive into that a little bit more. So I will, this is a real conversation that happened literally. Um, so I was talking to one of my colleagues and I was like, how did, on earth did you get invited to that meeting, right? Like I, I didn't get invited to the meeting you're telling me about it, but how did you get invited? And he said, I told them I wanted to start coming. Now, Margo on the inside, now you have to know that I tend to have an inner dialogue that runs like all day long that's telling me crazy stuff. And like some of the times the crazy stuff is good stuff to share. And sometimes it's not stuff that you share with other people. But in this case, literally the inside of me literally clutched my pearls and was like, yo, you could do that. <laughs> like, I didn't know that was a thing. 
And outside me just looked at him and was like, oh, I see. Um, but inside, I was really like appalled. And yet on the other hand, kind of impressed that he just walked up to a people and said, you know what, I want to start coming to the meeting. And their response to him was, okay. And now all of a sudden he's getting to go to a meeting that I literally had been trying for a year to get myself invited to. And what it reminded me is that sometimes, you know, following the rules is good, but sometimes following the rules is just following the rules and everybody else is working around it and getting something else done. And so maybe I needed to just walk up and tell people, or I just needed to show up to the meeting and show them why I needed to be there. And perhaps people might've gotten flustered and maybe they might've even gotten mad and I might've ruffled some feathers, but in the long run, would it have really mattered? And would it truly have gotten me fired? Would I really have suddenly had a big issue? Or would it have been a valuable moment for people to realize that they had had an oversight and not having me in the room was actually hindering my ability to do the work that they wanted me to get done on behalf of the group that was having the meeting in the first place. And by not having me there, it was actually limiting them, not just me. And this just really struck me because I just thought, wow, he has some audacity. Like, how are you just gonna tell people that you just wanna come to their meeting and then you're just gonna bring your own self to their meeting? But when I really stepped back and thought about it, like he did the right thing. So that if you see something wrong, it's your job to correct the thing that's wrong. And sometimes the thing that's wrong feels a little self-serving because the thing that's wrong is that you're not there where you're supposed to be. But that doesn't make it self-serving. Like the reason that you're asking to go is not because you were trying to blow up your CV. It's not because you were trying to show face and suddenly be seen. It's because you had expertise, you have knowledge and you not sharing that expertise and knowledge with the rest of the team is actually the selfish part. That's you holding on to information and not letting the rest of the team get better because your presence is in the room. And that's not okay. And so us figuring out ways to do that um, are really important. And me realizing that to him and to other people, because I've now subsequently tried this approach and it actually worked remarkably well. It turns out that sometimes the dialogue that we're having inside about people are gonna look at me funny or they're gonna get mad or they're gonna be irritated or they're gonna be any of these other negative things is literally a conversation that you're having inside your head but that may not be what anybody else is thinking one way or the other. And so sometimes I think we may talk ourselves out of spaces and talk ourselves out of actions because we're sitting around waiting for somebody to recognize us and want to invite us to the space. When sometimes you just got to go take yourself and invite yourself to the space and make sure that you have the ability to do what you need to do. Now, the second side of this is that I've had opportunities where I've gone in and I've said, you know what, I need to be invited to this meeting. And I got told, yeah, you know, we don't really need you in the room. We've got this person or that person and they're going to represent that group. And so you're not really necessary. And what I started to realize is that you are a leader in your own right. So you can convene your own meeting. So there's nobody's rule that says that you can't get together the people who you think you need to be able to move a project forward or an idea forward. And the beautiful part about convening your own meetings is that when you own the meeting, you own the chairs. So you set the table, you set the agenda, you make sure that you're being inclusive and you're being thoughtful and that you're being really intentional about who you're putting around the table and surrounding yourself with. And if your meeting is successful enough, you will figure out ways in that group to change whatever it is you were trying to change, regardless of what the other meeting was trying to do, or regardless of what the bigger picture is. That's how work gets done. And so this idea about when well, you can convene your own meeting really struck me as something that it never occurred to me that I could reach across divisions or reach across departments or call another specialty and say, hey, can we do these things together? Because together we're stronger than separate. And I know they're having this other meeting to do whatever, but what if we pulled together our people and came up with recommendations and we could just apply, we could apply that to their meeting agenda? We might not get invited to have a seat at the table all the time, but maybe we can get on their agenda. And since we're coming and bringing information that's a broader sort of stretch or a broader group of people that all of a sudden we can stand together and do a little bit different. And I think this is particularly true when it comes to issues around groups that I'm gonna call minority groups, but I don't mean it minority in the sense that like they're always necessarily the smallest groups, but they're the ones who are maybe the least represented. So for example, if there's women's issues that are going on in your institution and you really wanna have a conversation about it and people are not interested in having that conversation, Get together the women leaders and have a conversation. They don't get to convene your meeting. You convene your own meeting. Pull all those women together, talk about it, think about it, organize your thoughts. And then you go around and keep trying to get yourself on other people's agendas to make sure that you can have that happen. And even if it's one-on-one -on -one meetings where you're bringing that information, you may have the ability to affect change, even if it's not necessarily what people had on their radar screen as something that they wanted to do, number one. And so convening your own meetings to me is critically important. And then taking that information around sort of to make sure that other people have the ability to hear what you're trying to say is the number two part, and we'll get to that in a bit. So switching gears a little bit, um, mentorship to me is incredibly important. Um, I like Oprah's definition as being a person who allows you to see the hope inside yourself, because I think sometimes we beat ourselves up um, and we're way more critical to ourselves than we might be to somebody else who's in our same space. But because you're living with yourself all the time, that sort of narrative is constantly running and maybe making you choose to not take the steps and not be the bold person who you are on the outside 
Um, you may look very confident, but on the inside, you're hearing sort of nitpicking and you're hearing the thing that you said wrong at the last meeting or the worries or the concerns. And oftentimes a mentor can be the person that really level sets all of that for you, resets your own expectations, and then pushes you to go out and do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. So having a mentor is critically important. I do not necessarily think all the time that a mentor has to be another woman. I mean, honestly, you could have a mentor who could be in lots of different spaces. I don't, personally don't even subscribe to the fact that you should only have one. Um, I actually tend to think that this is a great time to pick people for the skills that they have and that they can bring to your life. And so having multiple mentors has really been helpful to me because I have different people to help pull different parts of me out from myself. But I think that you do have to be intentional about whatever you decide to do and whenever you grow and take a step in a direction that you take other people with you. And so this is why I think about bringing your girls with you. So that, you know, whenever we start these journeys, we often start with like, you know, the group of girls who are all with us in the class or the all us in residency or that we're all together. And then over time, some of us start to do other work and move in other directions. And if you don't ever look back and grab the folks that are behind you and help pull them up with you when you're going, then you're just as bad as the people who never look to include them in the first place. Because, and you might even be a little bit worse, honestly, because you know how hard it was to make that step to jump into that next level. And you're never gonna hurt yourself by bringing your girls along with you because your girls are gonna step up and do the work they need to do. But you opening up that door allows space for you to now take another step in another direction. And if we were to continue to do that, you would pull together all of the leaders moving in a direction that makes everybody just better. But if women are not gonna do that for other women, we can't get angry when men don't wanna do that for us. And so to me, it's critically important that whenever you're taking a step, whenever you're making a move, when you're the one in charge of the meeting, when you're the one in charge of picking the speakers, when you're the one who's in charge of picking the, the team that you're going to be working on, that you look around and see whether this is a space where your girls are. And I don't mean like you're picking your friends just because they're your friends. I'm talking about a broader definition of girls. I mean, all of the women that you know who are just down for the whatever, like they're just here and they're ready and they're willing and they're wanting to work and they want to have a space. You know, they have a voice that maybe they just haven't been seen yet because they just didn't get as lucky as you to run into the right person at the right time to have a platform to be able to speak in. Your job is going to be to pull them out of obscurity, put them out where they can be seen, and then you keep moving because as you move forward, someone's going to do the same thing for you. And you just keep moving everybody else in the right direction. As you're thinking about this, though, I think something that's really important that I didn't learn about until a much later in my career, and I guess maybe this is something that has sort of grown in the leadership world over time, but I just didn't know that there was a difference, for example, um, between a mentor and a sponsor. So mentors' jobs are really to advise you. So they're supposed to give you input and sort of give you feedback, help you think about yourself in a different way. A sponsor is not that. So a sponsor is really a person who's already in a space where you want to be going to, who knows you, who knows you well enough that when opportunities, when things come across their desk, when they're seeing things that might be able to happen, they're able to put your name in that space and tell people how great you are and why you'd be perfect at it. Now you use them differently. So mentors know all your dirty secrets because they're the people who you're really trying to navigate and figure out what to do, how you're going to get better. You know, I'm really struggling with this part of my job. How do I make that part better? Where do I go? Where do I learn? They're more in that down and dirty part of that leadership development. Your sponsors aren't that person. So your sponsors may be like your CEO. Your CEO doesn't need to know all the down and dirty about how you figured out how to communicate better. What your sponsor needs to know is that you are exquisitely talented in doing one particular thing. And if he ever has an opportunity where you need somebody to does that particular thing, give me a thought because I'm a person who could actually do that for you really well. So that if that ever comes across his desk, he's able to say, yes, that's what I need you to do. Or if, or if it's your you know, senior vice president, your senior vice president knows that you're really great in a particular area, that when it comes across her desk, she's able to be like, yes, I know exactly what I'm gonna call. I'm gonna call that person. And I truly believe that it's not just a matter of having both, although I do think you should have both. You have to be both because every one of you is a leader in your own right. And so there's always going to be people who are coming behind you and there's people above you. And so you should also be looking for opportunities to mentor and to sponsor other people. And when I say bring your girls with you and I was talking about pulling your team and it's not just your besties, this is what I mean. Being a sponsor is the person who is sitting in a room and they're talking about advocacy and they're talking about women's health. And you say, you know who does that really well is Anita. So can you give her a call? Because maybe you guys didn't know Anita, but I know Anita, she's excellent. She'll be great at this and puts the name on the table. Now, whether it moves forward from there, you don't know. I mean, like that's not your responsibility necessarily, but your job is to keep mentioning her name because you know that she's there. You know, she does that work. You know, she can do it. And so you're the one in the room. You have the ear of the person and you're trying to help that person move forward. You need to be both, but you also need to get both. And so no matter where you are in your career, you should be doing that in both directions. That to me is critically important. One of, the way we one of the ways we close the gender gap in both medical education and in practice 
is by doing this work because they know, and they've actually shown in multiple studies, men do this all the time for one another and women rarely do unless they're a coach to do it. And so we just need to take this on as something that we do for ourselves. But like I said, your mentor and your sponsors don't necessarily have to all be women, but you are a woman, be thoughtful and try to have at least some that you're doing that for in your daily day life and in your career. The third part is thinking about speaking to be heard. So, you know, it's one thing to be having a seat at the table. It's another thing to have people invite you to have these opportunities and open doors to let you show up. But if you show up and nobody can follow you um, or nobody can actually understand what you're saying, or if I invite you and I finally give you a seat at the table and your sponsor gets you in the room and you have nothing to say, or you sit silent, you've kind of lost your opportunity. So you can't expect people to know what you're thinking unless you're able to communicate that and get it out. And my mom always says things like, you know, no one can hear the ideas that are going on in your head. Cause I'll be like, well, I was thinking about whatever. I just didn't say it out loud. And she's like, nobody can hear the ideas going on in your head child. If you're not going to speak the things, even if you're embarrassed that you haven't fully fleshed it out, even if it's not all the way done, if, even if it's not perfect, if you're afraid to speak the things that you're thinking about, to walk through the conversation with somebody else and sort of speak those things into existence, you're never gonna really get anywhere because somebody's always gonna be constantly stealing your ideas because eventually someone will have the same idea you had, but then if they're willing to speak it and you're not willing to speak it, they're gonna be the ones that move forward and you'll still be in the same spot. And so nobody can hear the ideas that are just sort of ruminating inside of you. You've gotta be able to be brave and be bold and speak the things, even if it makes you uncomfortable, even if you know it might make the room uncomfortable. But if that's gonna happen, you just have to think about ways to say it, how people can hear it better from you. And so it's not that you don't say the uncomfortable things. It's not that you don't point out the things that are hard or that are difficult, but you figure out and read your room so that you can say things in a way that people can hear you better. Now, for me, the way that I like to do this is thinking about the fact that from my perspective, now I will tell you, I tend to be more of a lumper than a splitter, but there's basically four general types of people in the world. I mean, for all of the Myers-Briggs and DISC and fill in all the other blank you know, personality tests, they all, to me, boil down to like four types of people. There's these sort of holistic, big picture people, there's these logical database people, there's planning people who like to organize and plan things. And then there's people people who are just always thinking about how people are feeling and the situation and how other people are gonna to react to it. It's not to say that they're only in that space. I think everybody is really a combination of all of these things, but we're all sort of, ten, ten, we all have a tendency to lean in one direction or another. And when, when I think about it this way, what it helps me do is to organize the way I wanna communicate. So that I don't necessarily want to just communicate with people who understand or hear things like I do. I want you to be able to understand and hear the things that I'm saying, no matter which one of those types of people you happen to be. And so if I'm developing my messages, if I'm figuring out how I want to explain it, I want to be able to tell you about it from a people perspective. I want to be able to tell, the, tell you the details and the data behind it. I want to give you the big picture, the landscape of where we're going. And I want to do it in an organized way so that you can follow me and understand where I'm going. So that all of the people in the room, no matter where they happen to land in that spectrum, walk out of the room, at least understanding some part of what I'm saying and feeling like I was talking to them. And if they're feeling like I'm talking to them, they're more willing to hear it. Now that doesn't mean they're always gonna agree with me. It doesn't mean they're always gonna go with me on the journey that I'm asking them to take, but at least it's a step in the right direction. And so thinking about how you can say things in a way that the whole spectrum can hear and not just the group that maybe thinks like you or who is on your side already is critically important as you're thinking about saying things in a way that other people can hear you. And then this, this one always makes me tickle a little bit. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but mansplaining just, you know, it's a thing. And I know that people wanna think that it's not a thing and they wanna joke about it, like it goes away. But I mean, every day, I'm sure that most people, if you were to ask most women every day, there's at least one moment in a day where some random dude tries to tell you what you know to be true already as though he's the one who came up with it. It's frustrating, it's irritating. It is, um, it is dangerous at times. What I want us to think about is um, the fact that sometimes mansplaining is bigger than just an annoyance. Sometimes it's people taking over the, the intellectual property that you have by commandeering your ideas in the meeting, re-speaking them over you louder than you and in a way that people can hear in such a way that the things get attributed to them and not to you. And from a practical perspective, you know, it's not funny anymore and it's not a joke, it's actually now people stealing your ability to advance and to move forward. And there's no way, for example, that you're gonna able, be able to demonstrate the value of what you bring to an organization or to your dean if you're in medical education or to say your residency program director if you're still a resident or on your clerkship if you're a student. How can you demonstrate your value if someone is taking your ideas and speaking them over you? And so on one hand, you know, I think that um, it's worth always pausing for a moment and just thinking about it 
Um, but, uh, and I do think that for, for the men in the room, like you really have to get real about the fact that even the most well-intended men do this to people all the time. You even do it to each other. You just don't see it when you're doing it because you don't call it that. But I really think it's important for the women in the room to start thinking intentionally about how you want to get yourself out of it. Um, and how do you actually want to um, unravel that to make sure that you're able to redirect the attention back to where it belongs? So the way that um, I've been taught to do this, and it's worked for me fairly well, I mean, I'll give you a, a side, um, a sort of a side example of how you might use this in a slightly different way for some other folks. But practically, um, the way you think about this first is sort of checking yourself. So is that really what just happened? So do I think what happened just happened, happened? So just double check. Um, humor often will be okay. So you can make a joke. I love the way my words sound coming out of your mouth, but let me bring that back to what I was trying to get at. Um, redirecting it. So thank you for summarizing my point. I appreciate you doing that. Um, let me continue on with the conversation with the next thing I wanted to say. And then if it just gets to be ridiculous, you call it out. It'd be really nice if you would let me finish my thought before you interrupt me because you keep repeating what I just said. Um, and sometimes that feels a little bit more hostile than the others do. And so you pick and choose your battles, but giving yourself some practice and some really specific ways to sort of dig yourself out so that you don't find yourself in the situation sort of so shell-shocked about the fact that you're there that you don't even know what to do with it next. So that often what I have found is that you find yourself like, I cannot believe this is happening to me. Did that man just like totally take my whole thing? So you're looking around the room, everybody else is sort of moving on with the meeting because they're not giving any thought about it. And you're having your own internal crisis. Meanwhile, he is now taking your idea and run off with it. And so you've got to practice this ahead of time and be ready with what feels good and comfortable for you to be able to redirect people. If you're not a person who humor works for you as a, as a modality in general, skip the humor one and go straight to the redirect. I mean, for me in meetings, you know, my humor can go sideways really fast. So I tend to not use humor. I tend to go straight to the redirect. Thank you for sharing my idea. Thank you for reframing my idea. Let me go forward and tell you where I was going with it. And then when I'm done, you can tell me your input or your thoughts about where you might go with my idea. Reframing it, bringing it back to me, repointing it back at me. This isn't me trying to be selfish. This isn't me trying to be ridiculous. I'm literally telling you the idea. It's my idea. He can't explain it better than I can explain it because it's fine. It was in my head. Um, and so practically speaking, I think that um, for me, that's always worked well for me, but it may also work well for people um, to pick a different one and just practice it ahead of time. Now, the other place where I see mansplaining come up and they don't call it mansplaining, I don't know what the word is for it. I like to use the thought ally splaining. Um, this is where very well-meaning people um, try to tell me about myself, even though they're not me. So this happens in different spaces, right? And I've actually seen it happen to other people in other ways. And the reason I say this is because I think it's the same phenomenon and I, it's why I don't necessarily think that men are evil and they're out trying to do these things on purpose, you know, sort of to over talk you or whatever, but I've actually seen allies do this to other groups of people. So I've seen, for example, white women come into black women's spaces and tell the black women what it is to be a black woman in America and how they should be feeling and how they should be, for example, manifesting their, their, women, their women's powers or their women's rights or their feminism rights. Well, that's insane, right? I mean, like, you can't tell me what it is to be who I am. That's not any different than a man trying to tell you about the thing that you try to do. I've seen, um, I've seen straight people try to tell LGBTQ people about what it is to be you know, LGBTQ in America. Who are you to tell them what their experience is or what their ideas are or how they're supposed to be living their life? And for people who live in those intersections or in those spaces, um, I would argue that you could use these same types of tools and techniques. And so pick one that really makes you feel comfortable um, so that you're able to redirect people and help them sort of refocus on the part you need them to be focused on without necessarily burning all your bridges or having, um, having issues. And so sometimes I find those microaggressions really distract you from getting your work done. And when you're thinking about equity and having to be able to show up in a space and you're needing to be on, but also moving things forward, you can't get distracted by some of these side things. You don't wanna be going on side quests all day long and missing your journey. And so the way, one of the ways to get past that or get over that is to have some of these things in your back pocket so that you can sort of redirect and get back to where you need to get back to. And then later you can come back and have a conversation about a deeper, you know, a deeper way of addressing how you want to handle that in a bigger way or how you want to do that in the future. So that's sort of all the general stuff about talking about um, how to talk to people um, and thinking about how that conversation might go, because you're going to find yourself stepping into spaces that maybe you weren't before. The fourth lesson that I told you we were going to cover today um, is about protecting yourself. To me, this is critically important, um, particularly on today. So for those of you who don't know, um, today is actually National Physician Suicide Awareness Day. Um, and one of the places where we actually don't have a gender gap um, is around physician suicide. I mean, I'm just stunned every time I think about it that we lose three to 400 of our colleagues every year to suicide. Um, I'm stunned every time I think about how many of our young people we lose. So we lose a lot of people in intern year. We lose people in medical school. 
um, but we also lose our colleagues that are practicing. And I don't know that we've seen the full brunt of COVID yet, but I'm really worried about our colleagues. And so I think today, um, today, this talk happening to be today is a really important moment to sort of remember all of those people and to really, um, to really pause and reflect on the fact that for women, um, most of the time there's always a little bit of a gap, right? So usually the men are ahead of us by this or that. In, in physician suicide, women actually have their rate that's basically equal to men. And it's terrible because that rate is actually twice as much as the average person in, in, the, in the country or in society. And so that means that we're actually more successful at completing suicides than our fellow women. And we're actually at the same rate of men. And that's, that's, that's not the kind of gap that I ever would have wanted us to close. And so really, I wish we could close that gap in the opposite direction where neither of us is feeling the need to hurt ourselves. And one of the reasons why um, they argue that physician suicide is so high is because we are really, really bad at protecting ourselves and that you get indoctrinated early on into this idea that you have to give all of you um, in service of someone else so that you're constantly giving all of you in service of someone else. And in doing that, you never leave space, time or places to be able to take care of yourself. And you cannot be a leader and you can't be present for other people if you haven't been present for yourself. If you're not emotionally well, if you're not physically well, you just can't pull that off. And so protecting yourself is critically important, particularly as you take on doing some of the difficult work of trying to bring in you know, broader, um, broader awareness around topics that maybe people are gonna be resistant to or wanna fight about or wanna argue about. You're going to have things that happen that cause you mental trauma. You're gonna have days where you're not feeling like yourself. And if you don't take the time to protect yourself, nobody else may, and that's terrible. And so the ways that I like to tell people um, to do this, keeping it simple, because sometimes I can get too complicated, um, delegating, say yes to you, and boundaries. So you have to learn that you don't have to be the one to do all things. So if, I, if you had ever asked me before, if I would be the person who thought that having you know, your groceries delivered to your house made any sense, I would have been like, no, like I need to pick up my groceries. Like I want to pick the exact apple that I want to bring into my house. You know what, COVID really changed my mind on that one. There is something to be said for having your groceries just show up on the front step and all you have to do is put them in the refrigerator and you just saved yourself 30 minutes that you can now use to do something else. When I kept coming up to myself with excuses about why I didn't have time to exercise and why I couldn't get any sleep and why I couldn't spend time with my family and do the things that I wanted to do, it was always because I was doing all the other life stuff that I didn't get to do because I was spending all day on Epic. And that's beautiful. Um, if that's the life that you choose to want to live. But if that's not the life that you imagine and dream for yourself, the way that you get the rest of that work done is by delegating the things that you don't need to be the one doing. That's true at home and it's true at work. And so are there things that you're doing every day that you can give to someone else so that you can make space to do the parts that are important to you? It may not be all of it, but even some of it is enough to make it a better life for you so that you can now be physically present, mentally present, and emotionally available to experience the life that you wanted to experience at the time that it's happening. And the way that you're able to make this work and not feel horribly guilty constantly all the time is by learning to say yes to you. So that every time that you say yes to someone else, you're saying no to something for yourself. Now to, to, to you, that may not seem like a big deal. And like at first, I won't be honest with you, it didn't seem like a big deal to me. And this is a conversation that I had with my mom at one point. And I really thought my mom was starting to lose it because she was like, every time you say yes to do one more thing, you're saying no to yourself. And I was like, no, mom, I didn't say no to me. I said yes to the thing. It's not that big a deal. It's fine. Like I'll figure it out. And her argument was, even if the yes to you was that you were going to be doing absolutely nothing but sitting outside looking at the trees, you still had to say no to sitting outside and looking at the trees in order to say yes to the thing you agreed to do. And there is nothing wrong with having nothing to do. Sometimes having nothing to do is where your best ideas come from. And how will you ever have time to have your best ideas if you're always so busy running around saying yes to everyone else? And for me, that was critically important at changing my whole outlook and making me understand that I could free up time if I gave other people some other things so that I could still say yes to some of the people for the things I wanted to do. So if I delegated some of the things, I had time to do some of the other things, but then I still saved time to intentionally say yes to me. And the way that the way that, that was possible was by putting hard boundaries in. Now for me, I actually had to learn to schedule time for myself on my calendar because I will not cancel things on a calendar. So once it's on the calendar, we're good to go. But if it's not on the calendar, I feel like it's still blank space. I could put stuff in. And Saturdays and Sundays had a bad habit of always being blank spaces. So I'm dumping stuff in. That's everybody else's stuff. And in the end, I didn't have any space for me. And so I literally put in boundaries and make sure that I'm putting cutoffs and times and that, that there's times that I'm not going to respond to emails and times when I'm not going to be available 
for phone calls. And you know what? I can't do that meeting because that meeting is during family dinner time and I just don't want to miss my family dinner time. And so really being intentional about putting in the boundaries that make your life better and the life that you want to have. It doesn't seem like this is the kind of thing that makes your gender um, equity go, um, go, go you know, ahead. But if you listen to, for example, why women are burning out faster during COVID, all of the things that people are studying, all of the, the research that they're doing around it comes back to the fact that the women are getting double burned out at work because the work is just bad, just like everybody else's work is bad. But then they're coming home and working the second job of taking care of everybody else. And when you pull the kids out, for example, from school, they're also now serving as the kid's teacher. So now I have to be the teacher. I still got to be the housekeeper. I'm still taking care of the whole family's activities. I've got you know things happening 24 seven now because you can do Zoom from anywhere. So think people think I should be available everywhere. And that women were shouldering that burden significantly by themselves. And by doing that, many of them decided to step out of the workforce and are not going to be able to come back to the workforce. Or they didn't step out of the workforce and they're just burning out because they're trying to burn the candle from both ends. And so this year, protecting yourself is incredibly important because you're going to start losing ground and where women are able to be able to be present if you take away their ability to have the support they need to do the work that they need to do to both manage their family, but also to manage their lives. And so this is critically important, um, even though it doesn't seem like um, a typical thing that you might think about in this space. So like I promised you at the beginning, you know, we were going to start with the end and sort of end with the end. Same slide. So we're not going to wait for invitation. If you think you need to be there, go tell them that you think you need to be there. If they don't want you to be there, you're just going to convene your own meeting, do what you need to do, and then figure out how to peddle that information some other way, because you don't necessarily have to wait in line. You can figure out what you need to get done and do it the way you need to. You're going to bring your girls with you. You're going to sponsor them so that you're going to put their names out in spaces where you're at and you think that they could do a really great job and be helpful. You're also going to mentor them. So you're going to give them advice and help them get better and help them grow in their own spaces. You're going to gently give them feedback that helps them become better than they already were. But on the flip side, you're also going to be open and willing and actively engaged in finding people to help you do those same things for you. So you're going to let somebody else pour into you and put your name out in the world while you're pouring into somebody else and putting their name out in the world. You're going to speak to be heard. Sometimes that's going to mean just opening up your mouth and saying the things that are happening inside of you, because you're not going to be afraid that just because it sounds like it's not complete or it doesn't sound like it's done or it's not all the way the whole thought you want to have, you're still going to put that out in space so that you can have people start to associate you with your own ideas. You're going to flex those ideas so that people can hear them so that maybe you have to say it in a couple of different ways to make sure that the room follows you and understands. And if you find yourself in a situation where people are over talking you or taking your ideas and appropriating them for your own, you're going to have a way to be able to speak true to that in a way that's comfortable for you because you've already practiced it ahead of time. And so you can feel safe being able to sort of navigate that a little bit better. And then finally, you're going to protect yourself because without you, there's no you to promote. There's no you to move. And we lose ground in having yet another woman who's lost her, her ability to help all the rest of us get better. So even if you don't want to do it for you, do it for the rest of us, because not having your voice, not having you in the space is a loss for all of us. And we don't need any more losses than we've already had. We want to keep everybody doing the best that they can be doing that makes everybody better. So protecting yourself is critically important. And that means delegating. That means clearing space for yourself. It means saying yes to yourself, which sometimes means having to say no to others. But more importantly, it means making time and space to create the life that you came here to live, the one that you want to have, um, and not necessarily giving up all the things that you were doing, but finding new and creative ways to do it in a way that you might be able to do all the things you wanted, but with giving up very little and not having to sacrifice the you that you are intending to be. Maya Angelou is another um, person who I just love to listen to, um, and she says, do the best you can, um, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. And I love this idea because some of the things that I told you were probably obvious and you already knew, but some of the things maybe just struck you a little bit different. And so now that you know a little bit better, you're gonna do a little bit better. And we're not gonna spend a lot of time beating ourselves up about what we didn't know. I'm not gonna spend all day being mad that I wasted my life buying my own groceries and other people could have been picking out my groceries for me. Instead, I'm gonna be like, well, now that I know better, I do better and safely can deliver for the rest of my life as far as I'm concerned, because that time has given me back other time to do other things. So once you know better, you do better. Um, and then you just keep trying to do better. And that, that's how we end up having a successful life. And so for, for me, this is a really great way to end because I don't want anybody to walk away feeling beat up or like I'm picking on you or that I'm giving you extra work to do that you hadn't thought about before. But I want you to just pick an idea that feels good to you and see if you can't move that forward and just make your life just a little bit better because that just a little bit could be enough to make the rest of your whole life better because it could change the direction of where you're going to go. So with that, I'm going to stop and see if we've got questions and we'll have a conversation. So I'll bring Sarah back um, and see what we want to talk about next.
Thank you, Dr. Savoy, so much. That was extremely informative and um, something that we can all learn from. Um, we're going to move to the Q&A discussion now. Um, so we'll take questions from the um, Q&A box. Um, before that, though, if I could ask just one question. Um, I'd like to just thank you so much for sharing the leadership um, lessons that you did. Are there special considerations you um, have for medical students and residents as they continue in their training and career development? So yes and no. So practically, I think that all of the things that I told you are things that I wish somebody had told me back when I was a student because I think I would have approached how I did things a little bit differently. Um, so do I think you should figure out how to delegate things as a student? Absolutely. You know, it may look a little bit different. I will totally own the fact that, for example, you know, having your groceries delivered costs money. And when I was a student, I had none. And so that may not be the way that I'm going to go. But you know what I might be able to do? Get together with some other students and we figure out taking turns who's going to go get groceries this week and buying us all some time back so that we all have the ability to focus on something different for this one particular week. So at the end of the day, we don't have to do it quite different. We're getting a little creative about how I might work some of that, um, work some of that time in so that I didn't feel like I had to do it by myself. For me, I mean, I just felt like um, a lot of residency and medical school felt heavy, like I had to do it myself, like, like you had to do it all by yourself and that you weren't supposed to ask for help. And if you asked for help, there must have been something wrong with you. And you spent most, well, for me, um, I spent a lot of the time trying to somehow, and you know, at the time if you would ask me, I don't know if I would have said it, but I realize it now when I reflect back on it. I spent a lot of time feeling like I wasn't entirely sure that people realized that they had let me into med school. And I didn't necessarily want them to know that, that I didn't know that they were supposed to let me in. And I needed to prove that I was better than I thought I was so that they wouldn't figure out I wasn't supposed to be there, which nowadays people describe as imposter syndrome. Um, I you know, sometimes wonder about imposter syndrome because I think most of the time we feel it because other people are microaggressing you. So they're actually triggering you to feel like you're not supposed to be somewhere. And that's why you feel that way. But in this case, like I actually genuinely, you know, I was the first one to go to med school in my family. I didn't know what happened in med school and I didn't want to let my family down, but I also didn't want to let me down. But stuff kept happening that was harder and harder and harder. And I didn't really know who do you ask and how do you tell people? And you didn't want to show fear because, you know, I, again, like, you know, I didn't want to be the one black person that didn't know what to do. I didn't want to be the only woman who didn't know what to do. I didn't want to be the only first generation person who didn't know what to do because now every first generation person doesn't know what to do it. And so you felt like you were carrying a lot of weight. And so for students and residents, I would argue that that weight is not yours to carry by yourself. And the best that you can do for yourself leaning on others is allow yourself to lean on them because then it opens up the door for them to feel safe to lean on you. And it wasn't until I felt sort of emotionally secure enough to tell people that I was having a hard time or tell people that I was struggling and allow myself to sort of lean on someone else that other people were then like, you know what? I was having the exact same problem. I just didn't know who else to tell. And I feel safe telling you because now I know where you are. And so we could talk about it together. Um, and so getting together with like-minded people and being honest, um, I think is really, really important. And so I, like all of these things, I think are still true for you guys. Um, I think that you might find yourself in situations where maybe you don't want to challenge the system because it's your attending who's being ridiculous and not you. And so, I mean, are you going to stand there and pick a fight with your attending over whose idea it was to do something? Probably not. I mean, honestly, in the grand scheme of life, I choose my battles wisely. That may not be the battle that I want, but it does make me think about, can I find another way to engage with that person? So that at the end, when I'm getting my evaluation, maybe it's not quite as ridiculous as maybe it otherwise would have been. If it's a fellow student though, I gotta be honest, like Margo of today, if she had the opportunity to go back and talk to Margo in med school, would have really approached some of my more ridiculous classmates um, in a different way. Cause there were some people out there. I mean, we used to joke about it, like, oh, they're just gunners. But there were some people out there who really were very rude in their approach to medical school and their approach to conversation. And I think it was just because they were self-centered and they were thinking about their own grade and their own ability to look smart in front of people, but they chose a pathway that stepped on you in order to get to that space. And I think they needed to be checked on it. And I don't know that anybody ever really checked them on it. Um, and I know that me then, I didn't have the skill or the knowledge to do that very well. And me now wishes I had that. And as an attending, I will check that all day long. Um, I just pull you aside and tell you in private, but I, you need to know this behavior is not acceptable. It's not okay. And you need to get yourself together. But practically speaking, like, you know, as students, I do think you can hold one another accountable for just being ridiculous. I mean, like you see it happen. You can, you can check people on the side for being ridiculous and not kind of doing what they need to do. And I think that's not a bad space to maybe work in. Thank you, I appreciate that. We'll move on to our um, question and answer from the audience. The first question is, um, could you please provide practical tips on how to start and sustain a relationship with a, pot a potential sponsor? So the way, that, um, the way that I have thought about sponsors 
um, is that this isn't an overnight thing. So you're not going to walk into the room and be like, hi, Sarah, Margo, nice to meet you. I'd like you to sponsor me going forward for these six things. That's not how this works. So unfortunately, this tends to be one of those nuanced things. And so I think about it like your relationship building. So as a person who will go on record as actively saying that I hate networking, because I really do, I dislike the chit chat. I don't want to go to the little meet and greet and stand around and talk to people. It's just not my favorite thing to do. Um, think about it more like that than it is like other things, but it doesn't have to happen in those big sort of rooms where everybody's at. So remember I told you I was an ISTJ, that introvert side of me is real. I don't wanna walk into a big room with all the people having all the conversations. So for me, that is not the place where I tend to meet people, although that is a way that you could do this. Um, how I tend to actually do it um, using just my own self um, is LinkedIn and Twitter. So if I see a person who I think is really cool, very interesting, doing stuff I think is interesting, I literally will send them a message and just be like, hi. <laughs> You don't know me. I was reading about your whatever. I thought it was really interesting. Not asking for anything, just literally wanted to say hi. And then I find you fascinating. People like when you find them fascinating and they will write you back and be like, hi, thank you for finding me fascinating. And then you start a dialogue because you're still not asking them for anything. You're just starting a dialogue and making them aware that you exist in the world, letting them know that you, you see them and that you like the things that they're doing or that you're impressed by them. And over time, if that relationship feels like one where you might be able to gain knowledge or information, then you're able to make that happen. Um, sometimes you can do this in real life. So like in real life and in person, the way that I would do this as a person who doesn't like the networking part um, would be as I'm in spaces and places. So like in real life, we had had this meeting in person um, and we were all sitting in a room. You might choose to go talk to one or two people and find out a little bit more about them and learn about the things that they're doing. And then after you're done the meeting, or if you get that, you know, at the end of um, conferences, they give you those books that tell you all the people who attended. If you found people who were just really interesting to you or who were doing things that were fascinating to you, nothing stops you from sending them an email or dropping them a note that just says, hey, I met you at the so-and-so meeting. It was really cool. I genuinely appreciated talking to you about X, Y, or Z. Sometime, if you have free time, can I take you for a cup of coffee? Because I'd like to talk about it some more. And like, you just sort of start a relationship and get to know people. Um, over time, I think people will get to know you well enough to be able to then speak on your behalf in different spaces. Now, you're going to have to be thoughtful about where it is you want to be sponsored, right? So if... I'm thinking about sponsorship at work, then I may need to show up for medical staff meetings. I may need to show up for those cross um, communication type meetings where people are doing committees for things where you're now volunteering to do work at the hospital so that people at the hospital can actually see you. If you keep showing up at meetings and you keep having to be the person giving presentations, at some point you're going to gain the attention of the people around you because you just keep running into them. So you're having conversations because you're running into them and you're seeing them on a regular basis, which makes it a little bit easier to move that relationship forward in that sort of way. Um, but I think that that sort of visibility is important, but sometimes people don't have the ability to sort of decide they're going to be on the committee. If you're a person who is trying to do it in another space. So for example, I'm in the AMA, I'm hanging out in WPS. I don't really know anybody here. I'm not really sure how to make that work. Then you, I always start with the leaders of the group because they're obligated to talk to you because they're the leaders of the group. So I pick the one that's closest to my age or the one that lives closest to my house. And I just send them a note to say, Hey, I'm in a, I'm in WPS. I think this is interesting. I thought you were interesting because I learned about A, B, and C about you. Like, is there a chance I could talk to you more about WPS and the stuff that we do? And again, the more that they see you, they spend time with you, the more they get to know the things that you're good at, they can then speak on your behalf for other things. If there's something specific that you know that you want to do, I think you have to be bold and you have to tell people that's what you want to do. So that, for example, when I wanted to run for the board of the AAFP, it wasn't a secret. Like I told all my friends, I'm going to run for the board of the AAFP. I don't know when. But someday I'm going to get on that board. And what happened is that, A, I spoke my intention, which put it out in the world. But more importantly, like I had friends who knew people who had done work around these things. So they would say, hey, Margo, I know that someday you said you were going to do this. Had you thought about, you know, learning to do some speech coaching? Had you thought about learning to do this other stuff? Maybe you should go to this meeting over here. Have you ever met this person over there? And then all of a sudden you were sort of getting the sponsorship that you would have wanted to ask for, but you didn't even know you needed so you wouldn't even have known to ask for it because it became a natural organic thing that came up through your friend network or through your contact network. And so I, I believe in being bold and telling people what you're thinking about and where you want to go. And it doesn't always work out. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, just because you say it, that's what's going to happen. But what I find is that when people speak their intention out loud, the people who are around them, if you've surrounded yourself with people who are, um, who are, who are relatively decent people, if they have the ability to help and support you, and that's the culture you guys have built amongst your team, then they're going to work on that for you and help you do that. So sometimes you're speaking your intention at your job because you're looking to move up sort of in that space and being thoughtful about that. But if you're thinking about these other spaces and places, that's where you speak your intention. So you say it 
you know, at the AMA meeting, you say that at the AFP meeting, wherever you happen to be. Um, so that's the way I would do it. And then honestly, if you really want to get bold about it, and there's somebody in particular that you just, you know what, I'm just dying for this person to know that I exist on this planet. I literally would just reach out to them. So there, I mean, I'm, I've been surprised at the number of people who will actually take a meeting with you if it's short, um, just because you buy them a cup of coffee because you wanted to get their two cents about something because you're not really asking them for anything. You're not, you know, I'm not demanding you to be my mentor, which is a lot of investment and time. Just wanted to talk to you for a second because I just find you fascinating and I wanted to learn more about you and I wanted to hear more about you. And so I've, I've honestly, I've been surprised at the number of people who have taken me up on it and I don't get offended if they don't. Um, but like, honestly, a surprising number have been cool with it, especially with like Zoom and stuff where they didn't have to travel or do anything. And I could just send them a gift card for the coffee and we could sit chit chat. I mean, honestly, I found that to be an interesting way to meet, particularly like high profile people that maybe I might not have other got, well, I've gotten to run into. Thank you for that and, and for giving us the permission to do that. It's really important. Um, our next question is Dr. Savoy, you are fabulous and your presentation is excellent. Please share your experience of how your um, how our residency programs have incorporated or can incorporate your wonderful points in their day-to-day -day training programs. My local hospital is working on health equity every day, and I think your presentation will be helpful to them. So, you know, the health equity part of it for me, I think about I think about it like a lens so that everything you're doing is getting looked through that inclusion and equity lens. So that, you know, it doesn't matter who or what I'm talking about or where I show up about. I'm, I intentionally try to pause and think about, did I represent the widest group of people in the way that was most appropriate for them? Did I leave anybody out by accident? Did I, you know, just sort of accidentally by my own unconscious bias, leave out groups or do something different that wasn't okay. And so for me, I like to use that lens all day because I just think, you know, I mean, as goofy as it sounds, unconscious bias is unconscious, right? So I mean, like it sneaks up on you. And so like, if you're not constantly trying to like combat it, I feel like it just snatches you when you're not expecting it. And so like, for me, I think that's an important space to like sort of just show up all the time with that hat on. But then when I think about how you integrate it back into your programs, um, the, the, I guess the first word I would use is be intentional. So that I actually think that for a lot of us, it doesn't have to be extra work or hard, but you have to be intentional about where you want to put it and how you want to use it and what you want to use. So for example, in the programs that I've worked in in the past, the way that I've tried to do leadership development is not necessarily as a whole separate thing that we were doing on top of the work you're already doing. Like everybody already feels overburdened. Everybody already feels overworked. And frankly, from my perspective, leadership is core and fundamental to who we are. Like I, I think it's part of our professionalism is being a leader. Like by definition, when you step in a room, you are a leader. So how do I embed that in the things that you're doing every day? So for example, we give everybody a mentor, but I still think that's a bad process. I mean, like I know why we do it that way because you gotta get people connected. Um, but a lot of programs give you a mentor and then you're expected to stick with them for all three years. Is that the right approach? I mean, probably not, right? So maybe I assign you a mentor in the first six months of residency because frankly, you haven't been here long enough to know who you might work best with or have a thing. And then I intentionally disrupt it so that nobody gets offended because you know one person wants to change but somebody else doesn't, but you intentionally disrupt it and then make everybody go pick a new one that now they have some freedom and some choice but without offending anyone or causing any problem. But then the sponsorship part might look different, right? So for me, the way that I've had um, success being able to sponsor residents and students and things is that the students and the residents that I'm working with, I literally ask them up front, tell me what it is that you're trying to do. Like, who is it that you're trying to be in this world? What is it that you're trying to do? And we may not have an ask, right? So you may show up to me and be like, hi, Sarah, want to be an OBGYN. I have no idea what I want to do, but I know I want to be a leader. And I'm like, okay, great. Tell me about the stuff that you think is important, Sarah. And Sarah says, oh, contraception is important. I think people should have access to contraception. Okay, great. Tell me what else is important to you. Oh, I think gender equity is important. Like, I think women should be allowed to be in spaces and they should be allowed to be in spaces without being harassed. Okay, great. That's beautiful. What else do you think is important? Oh, I also think it's important that people get vaccinations because I think vaccines are important. Great. Okay. Those are things that Sarah thinks are important. And I literally write them down. So I have a really big, um, I have a really big whiteboard that has like the mentor, mentee people, or just the people who I find interesting that I just talk to a lot. And then I have all the stuff that they've told me about the things they're interested in. And then when I show up in spaces and I'm at a meeting and they're like, you know what I really need? I need a resident perspective about contraception. I go, well, Sarah told me she's interested in that. You know who else is interested in that? This person, this person, and that person. Of those four people, like maybe you should just reach out to all of them and see what they think. So then all of a sudden, you're now able to put their names in places too. And then if you teach them that through modeling, they're able to then put their other residents in other spaces, right? Or they're able to put the students in spaces where maybe you didn't know what the student wanted to do, but now that they get picked to go do something, they know to pull the student along with them. And so you literally make this chain where we're all holding hands, pull, pulling everybody forward, um, getting everybody where they need to go. And so that's why I say you have to speak your intention out loud sometimes, because if, you're, if your faculty don't know what you're interested in, or for example, maybe your mentor isn't the person who is your um, 
is it the person who is in your program doing the work that you're most interested in? So like, let's say I'm a medical student, like for whatever reason, the mentor I got assigned was in geriatrics. And so OB is not their thing. That doesn't necessarily mean that I can't still go talk to OBs and tell my OB faculty, hey, I still have this interest and these are things I'm interested in, right? So that you can sort of be intentional about that or tap into them and let them know the kind of things that you're interested in or that you like to do. Um, for me as a resident, um, I had to write that stuff down because it wasn't obvious to me where that, um, where that was coming up. And so since I had to do that, what I did with my residents is that we were intentional about having a session for them where um, instead of just saying everybody needed to update their CV, the day that we did that everybody needs to update their CV because I didn't want them giving me crappy CVs at the end of third year and me being mad about it. Um, rather than have to do that, every year we had a CD update day. And on the day we did our CV update day, we also talked about a life plan and a goal plan. So goal setting and being intentional and thinking about that so that then when somebody asked, you could say like, this is what I'm trying to do. And this is what I'm looking to do. And these are things I might need to work on to get to that because you've already thought about that. So you can bake that into your residency. So you just build it in to things that you're doing already or as you're doing projects. So QI projects are the best way of doing this in, in a lot of ways. So QI projects require you to do so many things that are communication, that are leadership, that are putting people in spaces where they need to go talk to stakeholders. So if I send you out to go talk to stakeholders in the health system, because I'm asking you to do this QI project as part of the residency program, I can embed in teaching you how to go and talk to stakeholders, also how you establish relationships that could later go on to be mentorships or sponsorships, because you're now talking to people at levels that you maybe don't usually talk to them about something that could be important. But you as the faculty member can embed that in the curriculum. So I'm not teaching you some separate thing where you have to come to another class and learn something different. I'm literally putting it into the work that you're already doing and just being really intentional about telling you things and skills that I want you to be able to practice or things that I want you to be thinking about as you're going to talk to people that sort of bake that into the process all the way through. And so that's the way that I, that's the way I've approached it in the curricula that I've worked on, just because like I say, I tend to be a lumper, not a splitter. And so if I can lump the things together and make one thing count for two or three things, and on the other side, I know how to integrate it really well, I consider that a win. Um, and so that's the way I would do it from a curricular perspective. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and we had a few questions about mansplaining. Um, and overall, how do you navigate interactions with someone who continually mansplains or uses microaggressions to write you off? Yeah, so this I think is always kind of hard, right? So this basically comes back to, um, for me, it starts with intention. So that, I mean, I honestly, like if I really have an ongoing thing, so this isn't a one-off experience, it's something that's going on sort of frequently. So now this is a pattern. It's not just a one-time thing. I think that's owed a conversation in private. And so I would invite that particular person to come talk to me separately from the rest of the group so that we can have a private conversation. And in that private conversation, the goal for me um, would be making sure that I've made that person aware of the problem and that it's not acceptable. So that from a practical perspective, I may not be able to make them change, but I can make them aware. Um, and I can certainly tell them how it's making me feel. And going forward, if that's a behavior that they continue to do and they don't make any progress and you can tell that they're actually not trying to be different about, um, now I know you're doing it intentionally because I've already expressed to you that it's a problem and I've already expressed to you that it's an issue, which is very different to me than if it's a accidental thing where people just made a mistake or they weren't thinking about it or they got super excited and couldn't wait to finish their sentence or whatever. Um, and so I, I start there um, and if it becomes an ongoing consistent thing um, and, they, and I can't help them navigate that better, I honestly will oftentimes cut them off of places where I need to be. So now I control the chairs in the room. You just won't be one of the chairs in the room. It doesn't really matter who you are. We're just going to work around you um, because I don't have the energy and the time to have to babysit your ability to communicate effectively. There's almost always somebody else that I could work with that doesn't do that behavior and I can work myself around you. And so you, if I can't teach you by being kind and thoughtful and giving feedback, then I'll teach you with consequences. And so either one um, tends to work out in the long run for me. Um, I do know that sometimes people don't receive that conversation well. And so you do want to be careful about it. And if you really think it's bad and egregious, I mean, that can be an HR thing. And so be thoughtful about the fact if you think that people are intentionally harassing you or being um, inconsiderate, um, sometimes that really does need to go back to HR, particularly if it's a power struggle. So your attending is doing that sort of stuff to you. So it's a power differential. Your boss is doing that to you. That's a power differential. That's a problem. That's an HR problem. Um, and you need to at least run it by them so that they know that that's something that's a problem for you. But thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Savoy. It's really wonderful and informative lecture and discussion. Um, I will say um, personally, you are a mentor to so many of us in the AAFP, myself included. And I know you're a mentor to so many others 
uh, outside of the, the academy. So we really appreciate you taking the time to come to uh, to come and speak with us today in the women's physician section. And thank you so much for everyone who has joined us. Um, we would ask that you um, please fill out the 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 evaluation that is in the chat. And oh, and by the way, I am Dr. Joanna Bisgrove. I am the uh, vice chair of the women's physician section. I am also a family physician. Um, but yes, please do. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And please do fill out the evaluation in the chat. We hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you so much.